Welcome back to Intersections. Uh, uh, we're now beginning panel number two, which will be moderated by D Dr. Eric Ganoyo, who will now come to the podium and tell you about the panel. So, welcome back. So, uh, panel two, uh, we now want to open up the discussion to questions of uh, the relationship of um, the city to uh, our concept of nature and the role that, uh, that technology can play in mediating and kind of reinforming that relationship. So, uh, we're all familiar with the kind of ecological problems and technological opportunities that uh, are faced by the contemporary city and that the city kind of creates and conditions around it. We talk about them all the time. Uh, but within that, we mean not only kind of like pollution and the kind of what's happening to natural landscapes, but also the kind of social issues of social justice and kind of long-term viability of the planet that, um, that's become kind of a touchstone for like modern debates about the environment. But uh, in relationship to that, I think something that helps us maybe move a little further forward in that discussion is uh, an emerging debate from many fields uh, calling into question the terms with which we discuss these things. So uh, I think of people like um, cultural critics and, um, and social scientists who uh, question the idea that, we, that the, our, our effects on the environment are all kind of one thing, with that, but rather kind of identifying the specific actions, even you know, historically, the kind of role of capitalism, the specific and more recent uh, and kind of uh, taking apart the package of man's impact on the world uh, into the kind of political realities that generated that impact. And I think of people like the philosophers and environmental theorists who call into question the very idea of nature as something that's not real. That's what, that was always a kind of conceit of a, of a pure, pristine thing that we can be other than and that we can kind of hold up on a pedestal that uh, that kind of frees us from the dirty responsibility of participation and kind of a critical engagement with uh, an environment of which we are, after all, uh, also a part. And so thinking uh, in that kind of tradition, I think the question that we want to look at today is what does it mean uh, in light of these kind of grand problems that we all face and in light of, of a kind of critique of the idea of, of the natural and what, what role uh, man's actions, both cultural and technological, can play in relationship to it, uh, what role uh, is there for critical practice in different fields? And so uh, for that, to ask that question, uh, we have our, our distinguished guests. Uh, so in order that they will speak, uh, we have uh, Dilip Dekuna, the architect and planner, uh, who's um, really one of the leading voices um, to think about kind of the relationship of natural and cultural landscapes in, in much more than just an ecological way, but in, in, many, in many ways. Uh, Anna Schuleit Haber, uh, the artist who's kind of explored a lot of, um, a lot of questions around the meaning of our, of, of our relationship to the environment. That kind of, that if the urban is always the sort of relationship of us to these physical spaces and places and memories, uh, then, then kind of exploring the implications of that that can be kind of carried further forward. And then uh, third, we'll hear from Anja Tierfelder and Matthias Schuler, who, uh, who work kind of across um, the kind of technological relationship with climate and nature, both on the kind of massive scale of, of uh, real advising of huge projects that are going on, but also uh, in the most aesthetic uh, and um, kind of most aesthetic and critically informed kind of refined uh, ways as well through their art and architectural installations. So uh, without further ado, let me hand over the podium to Dylan. So, thank you very much, uh, Eric, and thank you for inviting me. Um, uh, you know, when we see water doing what water is doing today, I think it is time to not just think differently. It's not just time to, to see things differently. I think it is time to see different things. So I'm going to make a, a sort of layout a possibility, I mean, perhaps a bold possibility. I'm going to posit, actually, the possibility that we have got nature wrong to begin with, 
or perhaps we have got the wrong nature. Now, I'm going to share with you actually two projects that you see here on the left and the right. Uh, projects each opening the possibility of a different nature. Now, and I will, it won't follow this structure, but if I, if I just move to the next slide, what I'm going to do is actually I'm going to have convention on the left and I'm going to have possibility on the right. You know. So first, Bombay. You know, I know Suni sort of pointed out the fact actually that, you know, that Mumbai is associated with the Shiv Sena and it has, you know, sort of cultural connotations. I mean, the way I'm using it, you will see, is, is, is the possibility that maybe we can see a different place. And, uh, and so what I am suggesting actually is that Bombay is the island, is the island city that the British uh, saw and that we still continue to see as an island and, uh, you know, a city that is an island. But Mumbai, opening the possibility that Mumbai is an estuary. And what does that do actually to planning, you know, and, uh, and the shift in thinking? The way in which we see an estuary, I mean, we, we know of an estuary as, you know, the mouth of a, mouth of a river, like, like a delta, uh, except that the sea comes in, you know, as much as the water goes out. But in a delta, it's more the river that dominates the sea. But, uh, but what I want to suggest here is that in India, during the monsoons, when water's everywhere, water doesn't have time to find, you know, lines on the map. And so it just flows off. And so you have an estuary all along the coast. So it's a meeting ground, actually, of land and sea, if you will. Um, so on the one hand, you see in plan. And you see in plan, you draw a line. I mean, and that is what, and that's how you've got the coast. And the coast has actually solidified, actually, into the strong line, as you can see, actually, in this trajectory uh, of maps. Uh, on the other hand, an estuary is open to the sea. And so it calls for seeing in section. It calls for seeing depth. It calls for seeing actually in time. So there's a rhythm actually as opposed to this, you know, divide. Um, so on the one hand, you know, we have marginalized the sea, you know, by drawing that line, you know, and so you have, you know, you have land and sea. But then you've also marginalized the monsoon because then the monsoon comes as a visitor, visits land and goes on, you know, that's the way we see it. So this is a place where I would like to see the monsoon as a resident, not as a visitor. So what does it mean, actually, to shift our, our mindset to an estuary, actually, that is home to the monsoon and not actually the place, you know, for the monsoon to be a kind of, you know, an annual visitor? Because in, in, in that particular role, actually, the monsoon is becoming more and more, you know, a kind of enemy. And you're waiting with anxiety for the monsoon because it brings flood. That's what it does. Then on the one hand, I mean, the convention actually suggests that when viewing in plan, you see land use. You know, you see land use, you see land divides. And so the island that you saw there becomes the smaller islands, and then it divides into smaller, smaller places. And that's how you plan. Planning is in plan, you know. And so, you know, it's not just foresight. It actually comes with a particular perception and reading of ground and terrain that may stem from geography, but then perhaps geography is problematic to begin with. So what happens actually when you see in section? And you begin to see, actually, that there are practices. You don't see land uses. You see practices in time. And so when you get the boat pulled up in the monsoon, you get, the, you know, you get activities in Bombay that operate, actually, on the basis of time, not on the, on the basis of space. Um, and so that's what you see in an estuary. Um, at least I want to suggest that that's what you see in an estuary. So what you have, actually, are two paradigms. On the one hand, you have a flood you know, and drain paradigm, where you're actually draining water off the land, because that's the divide that you that you're educated into, because it's separated water from land, you know, flowing, draining, et cetera, flooding. You know, so flood is nothing but water crossing a line that we're drawn. Flood, if anybody tells you it's natural, don't believe it. It's not. It's drawn, water crossing a line that has been drawn. So it's not about where you draw the line. It's the fact that you do draw a line. On the other hand, you have a whole soak paradigm, you know, and an estuary, actually, where water is held. And so when I hold rain, uh, you know, it's a very different different way of actually seeing. I don't see flowing. I don't see draining. So I don't see rivers. Actually, I just see rain. You know, it requires actually a certain dryness to see rivers. And I want to suggest, I think I'm just going to pass over this because, I mean, this is what, what happens actually in a, in a, in a project uh, where, you know, when, when possibility defies convention, we define, we, we look differently, we see differently, and we, we draw differently, and then we appropriate ground differently. I won't have time to actually spend on, on the details of this project, but, uh, but you will find it in, uh, you know, in, in various uh, articles. 
uh, but working by anchors, holdings, you know, things that live lightly actually in a ground in an estuary rather than this planning, uh, master planning that just fails again and again. So if I had to generalize from this paradigm now into, into, into uh, to what I really mean actually, you know, perhaps more universally, I would suggest that taking Paul Clay's cycle, water cycle, that we have actually chosen on the left by convention to inhabit one particular moment in time in the hydrologic cycle when water can be held in a place. So it's, a, it's, a, it's the realm of flows. So if I, do, if I had to look at the water cycle actually as, precipit as going this way, you know, the flow formation, evaporation, cloud formation, and precipitation, you have actually chosen, we have chosen this moment actually to construct our reality, and we have made all the other moments of water ephemeral. And so, the, so rain is a visitor, snow is a visitor, you know, and they're not residents. I want to suggest actually that, you know, that there's a possibility of actually changing the moment in time in which we construct reality, in which we construct nature. So if, if rivers are not natural, perhaps rain is. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, you get a completely different ground. Um, so what does it mean actually to design with ubiquitous wetness as opposed to the land water divide? Uh, and uh, would that suggest actually a completely different set of disciplines actually by which we learn a different, uh, a different understanding uh, of, uh, of the world, really? Um, so this I suggest actually for the ground of the monsoon, but I also suggest that it is a possibility actually across the world that we choose a different moment in which to construct reality and to make you know, other moments ephemeral. Um, how much time do I have? Oh, it's here. Okay, I do have time. Uh, so, so on the one hand, what I'm suggesting is that, we are, that our nature is by choice, that, that nature is not a given, and that and, and, and to, uh, this, is, this is a subject, actually, of study for the last five, six years now, and uh, it's turned into a book that uh, suggests that rivers are inventions and, uh, and that uh, they have been made over the years, actually, by a, by a literacy that has separated water from land that cannot be assumed to be natural. Uh, so what does that mean? And you know, it goes back actually to the school of Miletus, you know, sixth century BC, where this act of drawing the line and separating water from land was, was a necessity actually for the Greeks uh, of the school of Miletus, and they imposed it actually in a set of disciplines across the world. So you know, Alfred Nord Whitehead is sort of famous for saying that all philosophy is a footnote to Plato. But then if you look at what Plato was a footnote too. Actually, we'll find that they were, he was a footnote to the school of Miletus and their laying out of an earth. So material actually came before philosophizing, uh, if you will, if I can dare, you know, sort of make a, make a kind of claim there. Uh, so, so, uh, so what I'm suggesting over here is another moment, another time, you know, and another nature. Um, just to give you another project uh, in uh, Virginia, coastal Virginia, we're working there actually on the coast. So here I want to suggest actually that on the one hand, you know, you have a coastline uh, where, you know, the water's coming. And we have I've been in a community meeting actually where people have been, you know, to a drumbeat saying water's coming, water's coming, because it is coming in Norfolk, they feel the sea is coming in. But that's because we made the sea an outsider and an enemy. Uh, so what is this paradigm that has actually constructed this, that, you know, that people have this rising fear uh, of, uh, of the sea? Um, and I want to suggest, actually, there's a whole other way of actually looking at this place uh, at Norfolk. Uh, and I'm, I'm really looking at, uh, well, tide, you might know it as Tidewater Country, uh, which refers to actually the whole of the southern Chesapeake. Um, so on the one hand, you have a coastline that has been drawn, you know, and it actually was drawn only when, you know, the Europeans actually arrived here. You know, it was a series of frontiers, actually, that came, that came across and then went across the United States. But it was always a line that began with the east coast of the United States. And the further you went, the more reinforced this line became actually between land and sea. And so there are only two choices then one has uh, over here, and that is either attack the sea or defend, or retreat, I should say, defend against the sea or retreat. So it, they're talking about levees, you know, they're talking about you know, the mouth of Chesapeake with gates and you know, all kinds of uh, ideas like that. Uh, or, you know, as somebody told me in, in uh, this thing, said, oh, I've got a solution for Norfolk, you know, take all these people and put them in, in, in West Virginia. You know, I mean, so that sense of actually the, the retreat following this thing is, uh, has its own uh, sort of absurdities. But what we suggest is turn the coast. You know, instead of looking at the line this way, look at the line this way. I mean, you know, turn the point, I should say, look at the, instead of joining the points like that, open the points this way so that you allow the sea in. 
And then what does, that, what does that mean? I mean, you get a completely different paradigm. So here you have barriers and gates and retreat, and there you have high ground and low ground. So water doesn't actually flood, doesn't cross a line. Water just rises and falls. And that's the way, actually, the Indians lived in the, in the Mississippi, or the Native Americans lived in the Mississippi, as opposed to this one, where you actually then have a levee and you live across the line. But this goes into all deltas, and it goes actually to the coast as well. In the way in. So you have a paradigm, actually, of fingers of high ground, what we call fingers of high ground, and on this side, you have you know, levee systems like New Orleans, but you might be a little more intelligent today and actually divide you know, Norfolk into a number of bowls, if you will, so that if one floods, the other doesn't. But this is actually constructing risk. You know? And so you know, what, is, what is a system actually that one wants? Does one want to you know, define risk in this manner or actually allow for resilience not to, not to take place? And in fact, I, I missed that slide earlier on. Uh, yeah, here, where we talk about two kinds of resilience, one is a recovery from disaster and one is not getting to disaster in the first place. You know, and uh, it's difficult to actually argue that, but it's easy to design it, um, if you will. So, uh, so what happens here, I mean, this is um, just a project that, that suggests how this can be done, and we, we, we do it in two places, uh, two sites. We've, uh, you know, what does it mean to turn the coast? How does one work with communities, actually, in order to do it? Uh, how does one do it over a... You know, like I always say, it's taken us 500 years to get into the soup. It'll take us another 500 years to get out of it. So, you know, why don't we start that actually structuring? But it, but it requires actually a completely different mindset and approach that goes down to actually the way we understand our disciplines. Um, so so um, this just gives you a sense actually of how the project develops and, uh, and evolves over time and how we can, you know, sort of meet the sea actually in points like that as opposed to a line like that, um, and accommodate actually water treatment systems, you know, the sea, and you know, there are many, many different ways by which uh, we allow this uh, meeting ground to occur uh, in, a, in a more open manner. You know, so you see actually the condition, existing condition here on the left, and you know, to some extent this is recovering what we have lost actually by the filling of our creeks and the destruction of high ground. I mean, Boston is a classic example, actually, of the flattening of terrain. And now we are doing everything to regret it now. You know that, I mean, what do we do to recover our high grounds um, and to recover creek systems that uh, were pooling systems, not flowing systems, pooling systems with fantastic ecologies, um, which, we can, which we can recover, you know, and, uh, it, but it means recovering low ground. And you can only recover low ground if you start reconstructing high ground. Um, so, and I won't go into how we are doing it in Norfolk. There are many ways that, uh, that, uh, uh, that we can, and uh, we've established that possibility. But um, I think I've reached the end of my, my show here. And uh, this is, uh, I dare to you know, take on Einstein a little bit here. You know? So I say that we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking. I mean, he said the same thinking. I'm saying we cannot solve the problems with the same nature that went into uh, creating them. So what I'm suggesting is that we've got to start thinking of another place, another time. Thank you. It is such an honor um, to be back. Um, I love this place and its people, and I thank the staff so very much for having organized this conference with these incredibly inspiring colleagues of mine. Thank you for being here. Um, I am um, going to give you a glimpse of my creative proce process. Um, some of the projects that touch on urbanism specifically and some that perhaps hope to expand the concept of it. Um, my work often begins with a site, um, a setting that needs to be explored, um, that can be wandered, um, of which I then become the wanderer. Um, they're public and not so public sites. Uh, I'm drawn to the more hidden um, corners of public life, the blurred edges of our communities, large and small. At the Rhode Island School of Design, I studied painting. And um, if you held a gun to my head, I would say that's what I am. I am a painter. But everything that I've done um, since studying painting and graduating as a painter has sort of I uh, explored the edges of painting um, and wandered off into, uh, into larger media. I had to accept painting as a two-dimensional medium and uh, wondered how 
that medium would relate to the surrounding world. Um, it's outside sources. So I came to my work as a pedestrian with the wish to somehow capture the enormous architecture I was interested in at that time as a young student, specifically psychiatric hospitals, through drawings and paintings um, from across the overgrown lawn. I recorded my walks, using them as my hand-drawn record of my interaction with the site. Based on my interest in map reading and map making, they became a form of remembered orientation in space. And my first works were um, a failing of painting in that I realized there's really no reason to paint these buildings but to collect what's already there, what to, to gather what's already there. And um, passing through each room uh, in these institutions, I would take a paint sample. Uh, it was all lead paint. So this is my walk through the building um, in linear terms from left to right. Um, and the larger um, boxes are larger spaces. The smaller ones, the square ones, are um, patient cells. In its widest sense, I'm curious about the imprint that the urban environment has on us as its users, citizens, and the members of the communities. How we navigate our environment, how we make sense of it, how we derive meaning from it, and how we give back meaning to it. I, um, I found this place uh, in outside Pittsburgh, uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This is the Dixmont State Hospital, the center of it before it was torn down. And the Oculus that you see there has, as Dorothea Dix, the reformer of the 19th century, said, one of the most beautiful views of North America. The French philosopher Gaston Bachelard described the motionless daydreamer as experiencing an immensity of being. He said, Immensity is within ourselves. It is attached to a sort of expansion of being that life curbs and caution arrests, but which starts again when we are alone. As soon as we become motionless, we're dreaming in a world that is immense. Indeed, immensity is the movement of motionless man. So my first project, one that is, I think, a breaking away from urbanism, was a daydream to me, and um, it was cited here at this hospital, Northampton State Hospital, um, with its vast interiors, hallways that would allow a car to pass through. It was a large-scale site-specific sound voice performance at Northampton State Hospital, spanning 414,000 square feet of connected space. Using the hallways and rooms of the abandoned structure, like the, instrument, like the insides of an instrument, a sound body, this was my first project that took me beyond the parameters of painting, clearly, and placed me in a more experimental and performative realm. It was a form of architectural dreaming, without touching the building at all, because sound lives in it and then disappears again. I was able to work with the entire building without moving an inch of it or any of it. I realized that painting was not large enough, not inclusive enough. Sound was the only medium for me. I thought I could animate the entire architecture without disturbing it, interrupting it, reshaping it, or reducing it. So this was the setup. We um, strung um, thousands of feet of cable through the building and connected the entire hospital with itself. And This is the back ward. This is where patients used to be um, who were violent and often there for decades on end. And the sound was meant to be bounced through the building by bouncing it off a surface first. We didn't let it get out of the windows right away, but rather using the building to take on um, its color, its, its, um, its solidity, and changing the sound thereby. 
the, the sound I chose was Johann Sebastian Bach's Magnificat because I had been a choir girl and because I love that piece of music and because I remembered it every time I was in this building like a physical memory. I, it came back to me. So this is the solarium, it was called in one of the, one of the easier units where patients had small freedoms. And then uh, we invited an unknown public to come and listen to this. The entire thing was only 28 minutes. <laughs> it took four years to do. And we didn't know who was going to come, but um, the state hospital was long closed and there was no trespassing, of course. And we broke the rules for that one day, for that one half hour. And thousands showed up. This was in Northampton, Massachusetts. And I didn't let people into the building for obviously liability reasons, but I also didn't want them to play haunted house. I wanted them to give the building its presence and allow the building to sound. And this is how some of the people experienced it. I went back to painting. So back to recording my walks. And um, I didn't know how after doing that, after connecting with an entire community of volunteers, sound engineers, politicians, lobbyists, students, um, I would then go back to being a single painter. And I decided that that's just all I wanted to do. But the next project was a project um, which I'm just going to show two slides of. It was um, for the Massachusetts Mental Health Center here in Boston the same sort of building, but very different. 50 years later, it closed, and Harvard Medical School uh, Department of Psychiatry asked me to do the music again. And I decided I wasn't going to do that. That was site specific. But I was going to work with the building in a different way. And by then, I had experienced hospitals um, as a visiting artist, and I realized that patients were not receiving any flowers. So we gathered, we, my team of 80 and myself, we gathered 28,000 flowers and spread them throughout the building in a gesture of giving back to the building that which had been missing since um, patients in psychiatry rarely receive flowers. The project existed for four days, not 28 minutes, four days. And afterwards, we, re we returned all the flowers which were potted, they, none of them were cut, to people behind bars. So what I learned in public art projects was, became crucial what then happened, which was I wanted to connect with sites and settings on a large scale, but I didn't want to make public art, I wanted to paint. The next project was a commission for a very ugly concrete wall in western Massachusetts, uh, on the campus of UMass Amherst. And I proposed to paint a large painting and they were very disappointed. They wanted something spectacularly strained and interdisciplinary and I said, it's just going to be a painting. But the painting I conceived of was uh, the face of an agricultural worker. It used to be an agricultural school that I found in the archives doing my research there and all I wanted to do was to paint it upside down so that you would only see it in the water. I did not tell anyone how to use this work, but wanted students to discover it. So it was called Just a Rumor, and the ducks that live on this pond became my collaborators because they would wipe out the entire painting by swimming through it all the time. <laughs> There's one photo, and this is it that shows, oh, you can't see it, but it's a little dark, but there are four ducks parked in the face without swimming, they're not pedaling, and therefore you can see it. Um, they're just asleep on the surface. And then it froze, and we all forgot about it, and when spring came, it thawed, and we remembered that the piece was still there. And based on that, I went back to my studio, again, as a painter, as someone who loves to draw and paint, with my pens and brushes. And I thought, what if I um, create works that work with that scale, but are 
using my most beloved medium uh, in another way. And I was offered by neuroscientists at Columbia Medical School to collaborate with them on a project that uses eye tracking technology that is attached to your pupil, so you don't use your hands at all to draw, but you use your eyes only. And this is a drawing. This is my first drawing ever with my pupil only. Um, a camera records where I'm looking, and each glance, every direction my eyes make is recorded, so I have to be very careful and slow. And this is a bicycle on the right side going downhill. <laughs> you can maybe tell. <laughs> and based on that, I decided, what if I create live drawings that are truly um, touching the surfaces I'm interested in, those buildings and sites and settings, but um, for example, a stage with dancers. I was offered a collaboration with dancers. This is a draft for it. And then this was the actual dance. The person, the dancer had taken a break after a solo, lay down, and I was able to draw her a blanket of lines by using very high-tech projectors in New York on a beautiful stage. And it was a live drawing performance. So that's what I'm doing now. I'm creating these drawings that happen in actual time. They're not canned. They're not video. This is, a, um, this is an eye-tracking drawing that um, I conceived for the Cooper Hewitt Museum in New York. This is the facade of it. It was not realized because of budget reasons. But it was a drawing I did with my eyes looking at a Man Ray photograph that you all know with the eyelashes and the tear. Um, and the straight lines that come off it are lines that are made by my blinking. And most recently, this, these are smaller scale but still wall-sized um, live drawings transmitted from New Orleans to Hanover, New Hampshire for the Dartmouth Biennial. Um, every morning I made a drawing that was wired over to Dartmouth, and it was projected onto this wall very slowly. So these are drawings created for that wall in my absence by me um, in a different state. And we did 90 of these indoor drawings, one every day, and then 12 for the outdoor courtyard of the Hood Museum. So here's one of them, and here's another. And another, this is a goat, of course, and this is my last slide for now, um, a drawing of a hand created live, so it is moving. Uh, so this is just a still of that, touching the surface of the Hood Museum's back. I am so grateful to have been here. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, and thanks as well for the invitation by Eve, by the Radcliffe Institute. <laughs> we are very honored to be here, and we will talk about nature, technology, and the culture. Okay, and our panel is called Beyond the Nature and Technology Divide, and my first thought as an architect uh, hearing this title was, if, if there is a dividing line between nature and technology, a jumping over it is a typical behavior for people who have the profession of my husband for climate engineers. Because in, in their everyday work, climate engineers are measuring and evaluating and inter interpreting physical that is um, natural parametrics about temperature, about light, material, concluding technical concepts out of them as soon as these concepts become part of architecture or even more complex part of urban plannings and these projects get realized by interdisciplinary teams, um, culture pops up as the third term which, which beside nature and technology. Um, these three terms became the title of our talk and the basis for our thoughts and researches. 
um, to, to get familiar with the urbanism in, in the global age, we were tracing back the history of settling from today's mega cities to the very beginning of humanity and human settlements. <clears throat> we observed a specific interaction in the dependence of the three factors, nature, technology, and culture um, in every period of settling and <clears throat> each factor with different impact or importance per period. Well, now it's early for that. Uh, related to, to six billion years of Earth history, that a time, the 2.8 million years since genesis of humanity is nearly nothing. Um, another cave, please. And the place to see in 2.6 million to 10,000 years before Christ is the first in very long period of human settlement, and it's ca characterized by a specific climate by the change between ice ages and warmer periods. Um, at that time, settlement was totally based on nature and nat natural conditions. Um, this cave is called Hohlefels. It's in southern Germany. It was inhabited by a very long time, for, for a very long time, and um, remains of mammoth spears, uh, wild horses, were found and uh, the very first known piece of art, um, this Venus, which is about 35,000 years old, it's like this, a carved from ivory and a great cultural contribution. After the last ice age, climate stayed nearly constant <coughs> from 10,000 before Christ to let's say, 1800 after Christ. This period is called Holocene. And the, condition, the climate conditions were uh, very good for a widespread and widespread cultural blooming. Um, nearly everything we, we, we call culture is developed in, in this period, in this um, writing, architecture, a lot of new science, uh, knowledge and yeah every, and not it's it's not it's no accident that all the high cultures developed in this period in Egypt all over the world in China in the Middle East and so on um, this diagram shows the Holocene temperature profile I already mentioned after the long period with eight ages um, you can see that in the Holocene, about 10,000 years, um, temperature only decreases for half a degree. And nowadays, we expect a man-made temperature change increase between 1.5 and 3 degrees within 50 years. And this picture of our illuminated planet is, represents the period we are living in now. It's the Anthropocene, where humans and technology, man-made technology, determine the form, the happenings, and the evolution on Earth. Every light spot represents a city, a big city, and the light pattern as a whole, for me, gives an idea about all issues of global urbanism, about <coughs> population explosion, about energy consumption, about density, about neighborhood, if we are so close together and if we are so many, about um, the demand of land and food, about scale, about Heimat, it's a typical German word, about responsibility, identity maybe, individuality. Now, while the previous periods, like starting with the Pleistocene, which uh, durated like 2.8 million years or 2.4 million years, and then the Holocene around 12,000 years. Finally, our Anthropocene at the moment is like 200 years old, and it's as well called the time of the big accelerations. Looking on development of population on this planet, material consumption, but then as well the consequences in respect of 
losing nature, in this case, other people or created nature, uh, but as well kind of increasing pollution effects that we are created by our technology applying to be able to live in any spot on this planet. There are consequences out of it, a side of it, that, for example, here, a picture of Beijing, the, the lower one represents Beijing of around 5% of the year, 85% of the year, the, the air quality in Beijing is so kind of described as unhealthy or even hazard, and alone in China, they lose like 3 million people a year just by air pollution. So in a certain way, it looks like by our technology and our kind of leftovers from our technology, we are kind of slowly poisoning ourselves. As a side effect, we know, and Anya mentioned it, kind of in compared to the Holocene with 0.5 degrees over 10,000 years, we are now in this kind of 100 years increased already in certain spots temperature of this planet by 2.5 degrees. And in this, and then coming back to the first presentation, in this case, water will be our big problem because suddenly, and I think we can't solve it probably with an estuary, because interesting why it's now looking on this one where what we described nature now suddenly will endanger culture because looking on all the cultural cities along the east coast uh, of North America, they will be all gone. So this in mind, but it's not only endangering us, it's as well endangering any life on this planet, nature, alive nature, this is kind of uh, the birds, the farm birds uh, reduction over the last, just looking on the last 20 years, uh, in this case in Germany, uh, looking back by the intensity of our agriculture, increasing the intensity of our agriculture, we are cutting down the population of birds. Can I see the beauties on the side? Yeah, so and there, there have been effects, kind of looking on it, that like in 2007 they started to introduce kind of uh, bio, biogas uh, in Germany, which increased kind of a lot of, uh, of corn growing in Germany, intensifying creating big areas, but kind of cutting down the last refugees for nature. Now, what is interesting on this one, which describes the kind of the status of the habitats of the different ecosystems, just looking on three of them, the ocean and the cropland and the urban. For the ocean, we don't, 85% of the species in the ocean, we don't know what is their status because we are quite, we, we unknown their habits. What is interesting now looking, comparing cropland and urban, and I think this is now quite interesting for our discussion on urban, that it looks like nature in urban can find niches to survive compared to intensive used uh, agricultural land uh, because there are no large, there's a large diversity in cities, in, in natural uh, islands in the city, there are no fertilizers and there's no hunting. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> these are the niches, um, which are, I'm, I'm glad to say that there are, there are a lot of them, and <laughs> some of them are really almost unbelievable, these um, wild pigs, um, which live in Rome, I heard, and the biggest nightingale population in Germany is in Berlin, um, the biggest hare population lives in Stuttgart, city center. <laughs> Pumas in Los Angeles, raccoons and foxes, I think, in almost every city of the world, meanwhile. <coughs> um, well, what I found interesting is that animals that used to um, be afraid of people, that they are coming so close. It's, this is a kind of adaption, which yes. an, another example um, is are the storks. Only a few decades ago, um, they left their territory if uh, somebody builds a small road and divides it into two pieces. Um, a very short time later nowadays, storks have adapted to modern living conditions. They have even changed their tradition and migration routes. And a lot of North European storks don't fly to Africa anymore and spend their winter on waste dumps in Spain eating leftovers. Um, <clears throat> this is an example from Stuttgart, and where they found a population of a protected species of lizards, settled, which settled down in 
um, unused holding tracks of the main station. And as the German railway now, want, uh, now wants to expand and build something on this site, um, they really have a problem because following the German law on nature conversation, they have to organize a complete resettlement program <laughs> for this lizard. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, okay. So, um, to be honest, I'm, I have a quite romantic uh, relation. relation to nature and I, <laughs> I wish I could believe in a different nature as Dilip. I, I'm not so sure. <laughs> but these niches um, and the ability to adapt that gives me some kind of hope. And I, I, I would say that um, just because there's a lack of space and land, um, I, I think that nature will totally change and the scale will totally change. There really will be only spots of nature. Um, there are other people, wise people like Stephen Hawkins, who are much less optimistic. And he suggested to uh, seek space somewhere else. Yeah, which is an interesting position to think about that after a six billion year life of this planet, we messed it up in 200 years and then escaped out of space. So, but there is hope. We think technology and nature can feed each other. And I'm starting on one of our first examples. This is Mastar City. We already saw a picture today. We worked with Foster and Partners on the master plan for this first carbon neutral city in the Middle East. Now, what is the identity, how we typically describe a place uh, of Abu Dhabi? You typically get northwesterly winds. This northwesterly winds come over the Arabic Gulf, which in summertime heats up to 35 degrees Celsius, so around 110 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's pretty warm. Warm and humid wind comes from the sea. It's pretty warm. So you are exposed and you have high sun uh, kind of uh, irradiations. So looking, living in the desert, your air temperature reaching up to 46, this is all in Celsius. Uh, the, even the felt temperature would be even much more. Now, looking on the Abu Dhabi today, on the urban life in Abu Dhabi, there is no urban life during most of the year because it's too hot. And to cross a 35-meter wide avenue in Abu Dhabi, it's dangerous because you may not reach the other side because it's exposing you to around 150 degrees Fahrenheit. So our approach to said instead of this heat island we recognize from big mega cities like Tokyo nowadays is six to eight degree warmer than outside, we said the approach for this city should be to create, instead of a heat island, a cold island. So what are the technologies coming back to much denser cities, to cities which are self-shading, which are using natural resources like the night wind to cool down, to orient the streets depending on the wind direction that the warm winds of the day are not coming in, to add the screen fingers which curve to the east where the cool night wind, which is 100 degree Fahrenheit, comes in at nighttime, but allows the city to ventilate. This were the basis of this master plan. And if you look on it, you see this green fingers going through, but the very dense city kind of creating, allowing that the city stays 10 degree below outside. And this were our real time measurements, uh, measuring there uh, like two summers ago outside in the desert up to 50 degrees Celsius in the city, we could reach this kind of 10 degree. What is interesting in this case, talking about the city as a kind of organism, which reacts with the help of the, the wind tower to be ventilated at nighttime. So this mushrobia, this concrete elements along the facades, they collect, they store the, the night cool and help the city to survive over the next day. So we could ensure that there is an urban life even happening, happening during the warm periods of the year. And concluding uh, in respect of energy and consumption, this, this kind of 50,000 square meter, which were realized, consumed only 20% what a typical building in Abu Dhabi would do, still allowing, and this is the infrared picture on the left side, uh, to realize uh, cool temperatures. Now, jumping to our second project, it's an exhibition pavilion uh, for, the, uh, for Austria on the Expo in Milan 2015, where the overall theme was food in the cities. And the intention of, the, of Mr. Uh, Klaus Lönhardt, 
the architect from Austria was creating, in a certain way, a piece of an Austrian mountain forest in the exhibition as, as the kind of the Austrian pavilion, which by better air, by low noise, by good smell, by comfortable temperature would attract people in a certain way to be confronted with the benefits of nature in a kind of a sealed environment. That was the kind of the, the, the diagrams. We planted around 12,600 plants in this around 560 square meters. They have around 45,000 square meters of, of leaves which are evaporating uh, humidity and cooling cooling down the space, we are adding misting systems and increase the velocity in the space so people felt like comfortable in the space. This is the verification. So we could, comparable to Abu Dhabi, reduce the temperature outside compared to outside in the range of around 10, 10 degrees Celsius, a kind of an impression how you would kind of benefit from this microclimate in this space. Mm. <clears throat> um, last year, Aravin, um, Alejandro Aravena invites us to participate at the hmm, Architecture Biennale, um, which was titled Reporting from the Front. Um, many thoughts popped up, but uh, finally we decided uh, to do an installation about the power of nature. Um, I, <clears throat> right from the start, I had in mind to, to reproduce a natural phenomena because I think it's somehow it's a kind of collective experience. We, we are all deeply emotionally touched if watching the sea, discovering a rainbow, finding a falling star or something like that. We choose to showcase uh, visible sunrise, so-called crepuscular rays, or more poetically, angel stairs among others, um, other things because uh, there is a connection to a real research project Transula did for Jean Noël for the new Louvre in Abu Dhabi. Um, what we, we wanted to, to do an exhibit out of such a phenomena by moving it from the outside to the inside. Um, here in in the Arsenale in, in Venice, and we wanted to um, yeah, just startle these emotions. I'm really, because of time pressure somehow, <laughs> sorry. <clears throat> we wanted to do it quite literally and out of its elements, and we wanted people to get uh, very close to it, closer than ever, and ideally uh, interactive somehow. Um, in nature, this race can only be seen if leaves or clouds are blocking the light and create a high contrast, a brightness contrast in the visual field. And the light has to be scattered by little like micro particles in the air, um, the so-called Tyndall effect. In a long, in a long, long series of uh, tests, um, Trantula managed to create this atmosphere indoors. Um, despite converging on mostly every picture, sun rays are parallel uh, shafts of sunlight, and their, that their appearance that they oh, it's can you have they. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's just a phenomenon of the perspective of the observer that, that we always think they are converging. There yeah, are now people interacting. You can just go on. And creating another bunch of, creating another bunch of, mm. yeah, okay. While planning this installation, <coughs> dealing with the power of nature and a lot of questions arose about the interdependence of nature and humankind and so on. We engraved some of them into a wooden plate um, of the installation. Um, these questions are all about nature, about technology, 
about culture. And somehow they are also about urbanism in the global age. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you all. Um, I think just listening to the three presentations, it seems to me uh, I was coming into this, I was kind of expecting this was just the, this was the designer panel, uh, like a design and art panel, and then uh, it turns out it's the wetlands panel, and, and uh, that there's like the, somehow the ducks tied everything together. But um, that what, what, what we hear uh, across the table here is um, very different kind of ways of, of elaborating the relationship between man and nature. Uh, I hear first this kind of idea of alternate nature as as a relationship always between settlement and, and the physical environment. Uh, I hear uh, this idea of nature and technology together as both kind of observers and, and as participants in the, the kind of intervention in the, in the case of Anna. And then I hear um, this kind of, uh, this idea of the Anthropocene and, uh, and the kind of parallel between the niches of adaptation for the natural, but also then this kind of use of technology to deliberately alter or control natural effects. So in a way, like, uh, like deflecting, using technology to deflect the natural or deflect from natural forces, uh, Anna's kind of forcing it into participation uh, with the kind of cultural and physical environments that are, that are at play. And, uh, and uh, Anya and Matthias are, are using it to uh, deliberately as a kind of tool to act uh, against or with uh, these kind of physical forces. And so uh, within that, I, was, I, would, I would ask uh, first of all of you, um, is that kind of role of technology kind of calling into question the idea of nature for you? Or is it kind of allowing you to create a more spe like spe specific or firm uh, concept of the natural in order to kind of build build your own work from that. Is it a calling into question or is it a kind of a strengthening of a natural concept? I would understand it in our approach that it typically we are using technology not to ignore because this is the, the typical settlement in the Middle East is ignoring nature that in Abu Dhabi you were not able to live because it was just too hot. So people migrated from Abu Dhabi to Alain in summer, lived six months in Alain in the desert where it was the same hot but not as humid and then in fall they came back for pearl diving to live six months in Abu Dhabi and migrate back. So they adapted but by inventing the chiller, a technology, we kind of defined we are creating a city there where normally nature doesn't make it possible. So our approach was now understanding that we should not fight nature, but in a certain way support natural giving. There is this 30 degree cold wind, which can help the cities to survive even at daytime. If we don't ignore, and Abu Dhabi master plan is a 100% copy of Manhattan city to Abu Dhabi with 75 meter wide avenues, where you are just roasted by crossing the street at daytime. <laughs> Well, actually, I mean, if I, if I may just, uh, uh, you know, instigate perhaps a discussion. I mean, you know, what I found fascinating, actually, in your presentation, I think, is this, um, is this notion, actually, of nature adapting. It was interesting, actually, your observation that nature adapts. Um, now, that's, an, that's a very unusual, uh, you know, observation, but it's, I, I mean, I should say it's very revealing uh, of a certain, uh, of a certain, uh, I, I guess it, it's carried in the term Anthropocene to some extent. That that we are, we have taken the position actually that humankind actually has changed the planet. But then uh, you're also saying that nature is adapting to us. I mean, you know. So I mean, my question is actually, where are you really situating nature in this in this whole thing? So when you talk about the desert. And, uh, you know, you're talking about inhabiting the desert, actually, and then moving out. Uh, you know, I mean, you're talking about people moving out and then, you know, and sort of, uh, you know, that this is, this is uninhabitable, but now it has become inhabitable, you know, through Foster's design, you know, in this, in this manner. Um, 
you know, sort of raises, uh, for me, actually, very profound questions, actually, on your measures of comfort, your measures, actually, you know, I mean, everything about nature is taking its measure from the human, and that is, to some extent, both the Anthropocene is the other side of the Anthropocene. I mean, so when you're talking about but defining an era, you're also defining the era as defined by man, as it were. And this man is a, is a peculiar man. I mean, he's a man who's actually working with technology that they take for granted in a certain way. Now, I come from another part of the world where technology hasn't been imposed. So I find it interesting, actually, when you, uh, when you sort of present science as actually moving in a trajectory, as revealing actually an earth, an earth of a certain kind that I'm wondering, actually, whether you are defining nature to fit your technology and not the other way around. <laughs> no, definitely, definitely not. Because in a certain way, we are, I think this is the typical way technology was used the last, definitely the last hundred years, that in a certain way, it allowed us to, set, to ignore nature. Let's put it like this. And a little part of nature at certain points can adapt to our changed environment, but most of the of the kind of uh, this, uh, the sorts of animals or uh, plants, they will just die out because in this kind of inhabitable areas, they cannot survive. Now, if we talk about an adaptation, it's right. At certain, at certain points, what we did in Master City is, until now, there is no urban living half of a year, six to nine months, because between eight o'clock in the morning and 10 o'clock in the evening, you don't go out because it's too hot. So the city is dead. What is a city without street life? So allowing then in such a, in such a climate to allow to people to be living as well outdoor, I think is a big improvement, but not by using technology, but by understanding the natural forces and supporting the natural forces to help us to get this temperature. There's no chiller, it's just the outside wind. By the daytime we keep it out, and at nighttime we bring it in. And it's not our invention. If, if you go to Sicily and look on the old medieval cities, they're exactly using this technology, but we forgot it. By inventing the chiller and the fan, we just got rid of it. I think it's interesting that on some level the, the the design ends of the table are, are fundamentally opposed in their kind of <laughs> approach, but the, but the results end up being so, sort of similar. Like, is the cold island really so different from the high ground and low ground? Other than that, maybe you would just want everyone to go inside during the hot part of the day. Uh, <laughs> but up against that, I think Anna's approach is very different in that uh, you're freely deploying kind of you're freely deploying the, the natural or the non-human, the human, the technological. They can all appear. Uh, kind of one after the other because the actual ultimate question is, an, is about a kind of relationship amongst them all, but also to the end of understanding a public space that includes them all, including the non-human. Like, what, what would you say, when you hear the kind of debate uh, here, where do you feel like that your practice fits into this? I think I'm perfectly seated between you two. <laughs> <laughs> um, my role is not to solve problems. My role is maybe to create brief problems and then... Um, resolve them in, in, a, in a playful way. Um, I don't have to use technology to serve, but I can use technology um, to, to play. It's, it's, a, it's an act of play. Um, and to hopefully, not just play, but to engage. To engage and re-engage when engagement was broken. Yeah, I think that kind of question of engagement here uh, is maybe something that does, that still unites across the panel that everyone is deploying a kind of, an idea of an ecology, if ecology means just a system between the human and the non-human presences in, in, in a kind of coherent or sustainable like, uh, constellation, that everyone's deploying an ecology as a cultural strategy. That like it's, all, it's still answerable back to culture, even if, it's, even if you're not trying to, uh, even if you're trying to deflect back to it and allow the, the natural environment in, it's still answerable to, uh, to some level to, allow the kind of ongoing presence of culture, what it, but that maybe to inform what that presence might be. And I think that- You know, let me, sure. let me clarify one thing. I mean, I think that, uh, I mean, to, to, to argue actually with, this, with the sense of where technology and nature sit relative to one another, I mean, it's not to oppose. I mean, I'm not, I'm not opposing, opposing you. I mean, I, I think I'm distinguishing a whole paradigm of thought 
actually that is driving your, your <laughs> assumptions here. And just pointing out one possibility actually whereby I, I, I think there is a certain, uh, so, so in other words, Anna, you're not sort of situated between anything. You know, I mean, it's not like I'm on the other side. So it's just, you know, it is, but the, the issue is this, I think, that to, to, to look at, you know, to look at technology as, as some way by which humans, you know, relate to nature or means by which, you know, it's a kind of an instrumental um, uh, sort of, I mean, it's a means by which you, you, uh, you relate to your environment. Uh, if I look at it like that, I mean, I think for me what is critical is actually how you define environment, you know, and I think, I think how you come to terms then with, uh, with that space between uh, is, is then, you know, I mean, then follows, I mean, in terms of actually a space of design. So when I see you actually defining, it's sort of fuzzing this thing up, there's a certain measure by which you're defining both technology and nature to suit a certain, a certain mode of designing. And what I'm suggesting is actually that design plays a more fundamental role, you know, in taking charge of, of, that, uh, of that definition, you know, by which you have, you've sort, of, you made it, you've sort of made it convenient to act in a particular way. You made it convenient for yourself to act. And that to some extent, I mean, for me, coming from a colonized world, wherein I find knowledges have been destroyed, ways of being have been destroyed. You know, I am, I am called to a certain humility, actually, in my understanding of the space of design, and, and a certain reflection, actually, on what design can do, actually, not just to promote this, you know, the singular measures by which I, you know, that I, that I come to the table with, but but to sort of seeing that the, there are other possibilities. There are other, other ways by which people are, and maybe we have not understood them except on our own measures time. So when you talk about going indoors, I don't think that's the answer actually, you know, that just because I'm not outdoors doesn't mean I'm indoors, you know? So, I mean, there's a whole other measure by which, you know, I come to understanding. And so maybe indoors and outdoors is not a concept that I deal with. I mean, we saw, I think Suni's, uh, when you, when you spoke of there's no inside and outside in, in Mumbai, you know, that the person on the street, you know, inside and outside, that sense of actually the fact that there is no indoor and outdoor in certain places, how do you deal with that? You know, what I'm saying is that the measure falls off the table yeah, but the, when you don't have the context for it or you don't have the ground for it. Yeah, but, and, okay, I think you have to differentiate. We move indoor, this was a measure for this art installation in a certain way to get people exposed or in a certain way give people the possibility to experience kind of unnatural phenomena in this case this was a rain of light six years ago we did a cloud indoor so i think understanding the physics we are able to reproduce even indoor partially some natural aspects but we would never define i would not see us using technology to define nature because I think the point is, which we are facing today is that technology has led us that at the moment, my understanding is that nature is endangering our culture. And probably, as I said, the estuaries will not help to get the seven meters of raising ocean when all the ice is more right. melted. Right. Right. Let's keep yeah. this argument going on as responses to the questions from the crowd. So let's open it up. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, funny, I, I landed in Abu Dhabi. My name is Johnny Hasboon. I landed in Abu Dhabi on 4th of July, and they gave me a car at the airport, and I couldn't put my hands on the steering. So I, I, I immediately realized that this is not a habitable place. Um, <laughs> and, and, but I was stuck there for three years. Um, <laughs> But my question is that I think that between the paradigms that you're describing, I think, the, you know, I'm, I'm a marketing background and usually we find out the success of a project is by the market. Um, so we let the market speak and then when we hear it, say, okay, did that work or not? And my understanding is Masdar is a complete failure um, thus far with the billions of dollars spent on it thus far, so I don't know. Um, and my question is, do you feel that your 
the project Mazdar City is a success. Okay, I would say thermodynamically it's a success, the 50,000 square meters which were built because the urban approach to create a cold island could be proven. Economically, interesting wise, the whole exercise of the whole target of Mazda was to invest $22 billion to build the first carbon neutral city at the end when then the economical crisis of 2008 even reached the Middle East. The sheikhs didn't have the strength to stand it and they gave it to the developers. And what we see now, and this is very interesting, you can Google up the new master plan of Mustar. They introduced now avenues which run from the northwest to the southeast. They will t 81 meter wide, even wider than in the existing cities. So they will get the hot winds into the city. So I see it like this, okay, there's a, a lot to learn out of this approach. Certain technologies or certain approaches, concepts worked, but at the end it struggled on the limits of the economical system and even the people which at the beginning said, we are spending money to show the world that we, which are the worst guys because we have the biggest ecological footprint as a country of the world, we can show that we can build this first carbon neutral city. They didn't have the strength to keep their expectation, their own expectation, and they failed. So I wouldn't see this as a big failure because as a consequence, Mustar in a certain initiated such a lot. And I think this is as well, we had even, when I was teaching at the GSD, we had a governor from Texas there in 2007. It was just not even a year old. He was totally surprised. He knew about Mustar. So the world heard about Mustar and the knowledge was, and the news was spread. And we were always asking, and even talking to marketing people, what was the secret of this success? And the secret of this success is there was somebody brave and say, we are looking for a solution and not just talking about the problem. So Mustar at least set up an example or a try to solve it instead of just lamenting on the problem. I think this is the biggest success. I really appreciate you saying um, that technology is endangering us because um, with all the gizmos coming out every year, people have been lulled into thinking that that's the answer. No. We might run out of fuel at some point uh, for some things, uh, which brings me to Dillip. I loved loved what you did. I can't wait to uh, read the book or see the program or go to the movie or whatever happens with that. One question about high ground, low ground. Um, in these cities that are talking about resilience and sustainability, at least on the East Coast, I hear that the priority for going high is like making the highway, which is next to the water, even higher. In your diagram, is going high human access, you know, uh, living areas connected to living areas, or is it the transportation, the, the trucking corridors, the, the whatever? And um, I wonder in the break if we can see the trans solar slides flip the way we saw SUNY's. Uh, the spectacular amount of information put together. Um, you know, I mean, one of the one of the issues I think that uh, that come up with uh, with the fingers of what we call the fingers of high ground, in, in, you know, as a as a well, a solution. You know, I mean, I, I sort of hesitate to use that term, but as a as as perhaps an alternate as an alternate, uh, alternate approach, is that there is a particularity is a particularity to them actually depending on where they are, you know, that, uh, that defines. So the two projects that we did uh, in, in Norfolk, I mean, one was actually with the, with, uh, you know, in uh, sort of next to the Naval Yard, I mean, it was, it was with the, the, you know, on the Elizabeth, on the Elizabeth River. So it, it was an infrastructural, it was a real, you know, where real meets, uh, where real meets sea, as it were, you know, real meets the Elizabeth. 
And so it, uh, it had particular conditions, actually, by which people were, you know, that either there was a treatment, there was a treatment plant over there, there was a, and we took on issues that were very particular to that. The, the treatment plant when, you know, when there's a hurricane, for example, uh, they, you know, they sort of release sewage into the, into the ocean. So we said, why don't we design barges, actually, as extension of fingers, to actually then also dissipate waves, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so there was, you know, so what I'm saying is that there's a particularity uh, to, to each finger. Uh, but that is actually, you know, on, on you know, the, the issues that we are facing, you know, from the, from the sea. But then there are community issues. You know, we found that in Norfolk, for example, that, uh, that the people actually living on the sea were not that endangered as people living inland because rain had nowhere to go. So the people who were, you know, drowning or, you know, I mean, people in danger of this thing were actually inland. So it was actually between rain and tide that we were, that we were designing. So, so yes, you know, the, the, the complexity builds up, but I think that that is the beauty actually of working, working with a particular on the East Coast. So why, while we can make a kind of general comment actually on turning the coast, um, it really requires very grassroots, uh, uh, you know, sort of activity in terms of, uh, and we've tried uh, actually to do that, but you know, it really needs, uh, you know, people are willing to change governance, actually. So governance structures are in, in, in the Chesapeake, and, and that is happening slowly, you know. So we are still in conversation with the Army Corps of Engineers, actually, uh, working in, in, in that area. But, uh, and we are dying to actually do a, you know, a pilot project where we can actually reveal the diversity of these, uh, you know, the things. I'm not quite sure if I'm answering your question, am I? Uh, I, just, I just think it would be awfully interesting if all these towns in, um, in jeopardy would have maps around the town showing the high ground, low ground. Unless people know what to do. This is a different way of thinking. Although in New Orleans, they figured out pretty fast where the high ground was, which were the overpasses. Um, but it would just be a nice, it would be interesting to remap one's world into high ground, low ground. And it, falls, it doesn't rely on technology, it relies on nature helping us, which is, uh, which is grade, uh, um, grade, elevation. You know, can I take a little more time? I hope I'm not, I don't want to be uh, taking time from, from the others underneath here. Uh, but I just want to raise a point. I mean, one of the, one of the beautiful things about thinking about high ground, low ground versus, versus, uh, versus a coastline is that, uh, that when we think, uh, when, we, when we read the surface of the earth, actually in terms of urban rural, for example, uh, we are seeing actually, you know, cities, which is a question actually for the for this whole symposium actually, which I sort of find a little problematic because when we use the term urban, we are actually using it exclusively and excluding things that 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 are outside of it. Um, you know, so when one refers to the desert, et cetera, et cetera, one is actually positioning it outside, and, and I wonder sometimes what one is positioning outside of the of the city. But that reading actually, where the city has been given a measure to things is very different from a middle ground, for example. And so if I actually do maps that, uh, that work with, uh, with drawing the middle ground out as the agency with which we work, you get a completely different structuring, actually, of the surface of the earth, you know, as compared to the, the working with cities that you can then talk about as successes, which, uh, which is, I mean, to me, I mean, extremely problematic, but I don't want to get into that discussion because it all depends on how you define the problem in order to fit the solution. <coughs> The solution, I think, one of the problems here is that if you look at the projections, there are maps, by the way, available showing what sea level rise would do to the coastal cities, but yet money is pouring into Seaport or into Miami Beach. Uh, on the premises, I suspect that by the time the disaster hits in 2050 or 2070, we've had our money, the original owners have sold it, but if you even can sell it. But uh, looking at the uh, heat issue, uh, if you look at the projections for the Arabian Peninsula, what wet bulb temperatures, by uh, 2050 or 60, there won't be any cool winds coming off and the humidity range is needed. So trying to design on today's parameters, but ignoring 25 or 30 years out, let alone 50, 100, at one time you could walk from Boston Light uh, all the way out uh, during the glacial uh, maximum, all the way out to uh, the George's Bank. Uh, th three, 70 meters is a lot to overcome, and you're not gonna do it by trying to imitate uh, Dutch technology. Uh, it'll buy a few years, but that's all it's going to buy. So I guess my question for the panel is, what are we going to start looking at reasonable uh, projections uh, rather than sort of work on these very narrow time frames of 20 or 30 years 
and ignore the fact that it's going to be a lot different by the time I'm dead and well, everybody in this room is dead, but our children and our grandchildren will have to face a whole different world. I would see we are looking on the next years because politically the decisions we do the next years, they will determine the next 15, the next 100 years because the time is so late that our decisions are so critical that expecting that this might be solved with the technology in 10 or 15 years, that's too late. Because, and I think this is the dangerous kind of performance or habit of climate change, that you don't feel it before it really strikes and then it's too late because the system is so big. So, and this is nature. So this is then, again, we go back to the discussion that and so we, we messed it up. And the question is, are we able to bring it back to a certain performance? I think the planet will survive because it survived other waves of temperature. The question is if the human period will survive. All right, I think we can start <laughs> wrap it up at oh. that. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, yeah, please. <laughs> Got it. It's <laughs> <laughs>